We're going to be featuring a little bit later Jim Blenfesty as our, our guest speaker. The, the poetry series is named in honor of Marcia Pancake, who I'm sure many of us know, an extraordinary librarian, and her career was dedicated to poetry and literature. And it was through her initiative that the libraries began sponsoring a poetry event every April for Poetry Month. And it seems only fitting that when she retired, we wanted to honor her by keeping that tradition alive and the excellent work that uh, she has, has done in the past with poetry. I remember at her retirement reception, I started inventorying the many uh, adjectives that people had used to describe her work in the libraries. They spoke about her dedication, her inspiration, her fresh and aspirational approach to building our literary collections, her marvelous programs, such as the annual poetry event, that highlight and extend the reach of our collections. And we hope this annual event uh, will live up to the high bar she has set. And we're most grateful for the work she did to lay the groundwork on campus and uh, getting people to explore and to experience poetry as a community. Now, before I uh, introduce our speaker, I want to give Marcia a chance to uh, take the stage, if you will. Where is she? Back there. And uh, great to have you back, Marcia. <laughs> Around 30 BC, in his Georgics, as translated by David Ferry, Virgil wrote, it is a fallen world and all creatures are vulnerable. But the poem is one of the great songs, maybe the greatest human accomplishment in the difficult circumstances of the way things are. Difficult circumstances now for many people, and thank heavens for poetry. You might expect a librarian to begin by referring to a book, and so I will mention another. A decade ago, I read Roger Rosenblatt's Rules for Aging. Rosenblatt, a columnist for the Washington Post, you know, offered 54 rules which, quote, tell you to resist normal impulses, live longer, and attain perfection. <laughs> Some of them are number two. Nobody is thinking about you. They're thinking of themselves, like you. <laughs> number 22. Never miss an opportunity to do nothing. Oh, I guess I blew that one. <laughs> My favorite of his rules is number 30. It's not about you. So let's say this is not about me. Grateful and flattered that I am to have my name attached to this event. I had the good fortune to work with many, many distinguished and accomplished librarians at the university libraries, including Jim Kingsley of Special Collections, Jack Parker of the Bell Library, Vera Clausen and Jesse Richardson of the Biomed Library, and my immediate colleagues in Wilson Library. Instead, we celebrate poetry in libraries. Libraries bring people together in time and in space. You cross time when you hold in your hands the paper on which Conan Doyle wrote a Sherlock Holmes story, or when you see, also in our special collections archives, the little notebooks that James Wright carried in his shirt pocket in which he jotted the first ideas for his poems. Crossing time and bridging space, bringing minds together. We make a dwelling in the evening air in which being there together is enough, Wallace Stevens. Libraries create real communities. We gather in this space for each other's company to hear Jim Lenfesti by his poems remind us of another poet from the far side of the world. So today, lucky, during National Library Week and National Poetry Month, we celebrate poetry and the community of writers in Minnesota, many of whom are here, and the collecting, preserving, and dissemination of words by libraries. I'm happy you have come. I thank Mr. Lenfesty, not only for his poems and film today, but also for his crucial work in helping the library add to our literary manuscripts collections. And I thank the goddesses of Greek myth who inspired the creation of literature, our own four muses, Wendy Luger, Kathy McGill, Linnea Stangrit, and Malika Grant. Mm. 
Well, today's program uh, is jointly sponsored, actually, by the libraries and the Friends of the University Libraries. And I want to uh, give a special call out to the many Friends board members that are here joining us. It's uh, your commitment and support that helps us bring events such as this to the, to the uh, community. I also want to thank and acknowledge Malika Grant, our Associate Librarian for English and African and African American Studies, for organizing this event. Malika, over there. <laughs> And also, I hope to introduce uh, Cecily Marcus. Oh, there she is, over in the corner. Now our curator of the Upper Midwest Literary Archives, um, Malika and Cecily will be continuing to carry the torch for Poetry Month in the future, and, and we're really proud of that. It's now my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, distinguished poet Jim Lenfesti. He has a career in academia, in advertising, and in journalism. As an editorial writer at the Minneapolis Star Tribune, where he won several Page One awards for excellence. He played a key leadership role in helping the libraries and acquiring the Robert Bly archives, and putting together a distinguished group of scholars and editors, poets and storytellers from around the world to come together for the Robert Bly and His World conference last year. Jim has long been dedicated to the Chinese poet Hong Chong, and I cannot begin to do justice to that work and also to uh, the inspiration that it has uh, beget among many. But I'm going to draw on an unusual review of his work, a phone message from the late Bill Holm left, I assume, on Jim's answering machine, a voice of praise about Cold Mountain. So here's what the recording said. This is Reverend Holm of the Church of Minneota, below zero. And one of the things the cold drove me to is reading Chinese poetry again. I started reading Cold Mountain, Burton Watson's old translations, and Gary Snyder's, and David Hinton's. And that drove me back to a cartload of scrolls, which I had read cursorily when I got it, a handsome book, gems in it, and now I read it with great care and attention after immersing myself in Cold Mountain. You got a keeper there, Mr. Lenfesti. You should be proud of that one. It's a nice piece of work. At any rate, no need to call me back. Pat yourself on the back. It's a useful book. I would add, that message is a keeper. <laughs> Without further ado, let me introduce Jim Lenfesti. Okay, there we go. And so this one's not needed? Okay, good, I tend to lean in but I, um, and pop the peas on these things. Tell me if I'm popping the peas on this thing. But it's a great honor to be here and to hear, be reminded of Bill's voice on the answering machine and Bill, a great friend and our, our giant of poetry in Minnesota that late lamented. And it's an honor to be in, in my, one of my favorite buildings in the state of Minnesota. Uh, I, I love what goes on on the four or five floors above here. The people who have already been celebrated tonight about doing the work of archives and libraries. And I love the work that goes on seven floors Very below. Sorry. I'm okay with this thing. If you don't, I, one gets, as we know, friends, there's a static, coyote static, every, in every one of these. <laughs> And I love the work that goes on below, which seven floors below, which houses the archives of the people of Minnesota, the literary archives and many others. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be standing in this building. Now, I'm a little disappointed because I'd planned to be the first uh, ever in the use of the, of the Marcia pancake poetry joke, which, which is that you know, this is a great idea. <laughs> it's a great idea, shall we say. Hang on. I'll get I'm happy to use that one, sure. <laughs> All right. Now, the poetry joke, which, which is surprising and ongoing. Yeah, I wrote about Coyote for years, and he's back. 
But Cold Mountain is all about that too. But the first, first annual Marcia Pancake Poetry Joke, which is obvious but already been alluded to, that it's, it's an honor to be here with this wonderful food and wine and, and uh, I, I presume champagne after. <laughs> uh, but it really should be done in the morning with maple syrup and pancake and orange juice, as you know, or, and, and, and bacon. Uh, but uh, Marcia, thank you for all the work you've done, and John for giving her that wonderful last name, which we can, we can parade around for the rest of our lives, just fabulous. And uh, so I'm gonna do something a bit unusual here for what's often called the poetry reading, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something which I'm underway in in my next book. I'm gonna do a haibun. A haibun is a Japanese form, which is a travel narrative in which poems are embedded. The book that we're talking about tonight uh, the poems, so the poems I'm going to read and recite come from the book here, which is a cartload of scrolls. Uh, but the form is going to be my next book, which is called Seeking the Cave, which is a travel narrative that's common in, in ancient Japanese or uh, a literature where the poems are embedded. So I'm going to tell you a story. And the story is going to be how we got to have this film made and how this whole thing came about that I became infected with uh, the spirit of Cold Mountain or Han Shan. Uh, then we'll show this film. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you for about 25 minutes, and the film's about 25 minutes long, broadcast length, and then when it's over, I'll do one poem from the new book, maybe two or three, one, if I'm sensible, and, uh, and then we'll have Q&A and party down. And thank you for all, thank you for all being here. Because uh, the key is, so for now, for these first 25 minutes, kick back, you can close your eyes if you want, because videographers, photographers, visual artists, that's about seeing. Poetry is about hearing, it's about sound, all about sound. If you're not infected with sound, you're in the wrong business. And so uh, that, that's what this first part is about. So sometime during the Tang Dynasty, which is 609 to 941 AD in China, uh, a scruffy hermit, a friend of farmers and, and Buddhists and Taoists, he was once married but now separated from his wife and child, nobody knows why, who once rode a white horse, was sort of the equivalent of right, driving around in a Ferrari in Washington, D.C. Uh, probably failed to pass the civil service exam, all the guys did. You know, if you were educated, you wanted to take the civil service exam, you banged your head against it two or three times, sometimes you passed. A lot of guys failed, and they all wanted to become teachers or bureaucrats, the only jobs an educated man could get. Now he's elderly, wearing a poor man's birch bark hat, hanging out with his two friends, Fang Kang, the, the monk, uh, and uh, Shurda, the, the foundling. And he and he would have been vanished into the interstices of history as have so many poets and others throughout time, but for the fact that somebody came along and gathered up his poems which were carved on trees and painted on rocks and, and uh, painted on temple walls. Poems like this. Here we languish, a bunch of poor scholars ravaged by extremes of hunger and cold. Out of work our only joy is poetry. Scribble, scribble, we wear out our brains. Who will read the works of such men? On that point, ladies and gentlemen, you can save your sighs. We could inscribe our poems on biscuits, and homeless dogs wouldn't deign to nibble. <laughs> well, I laughed too. In 1974, when I was given this book by a friend in a bookstore, and said, here, he said to me, here, read these. Uh, and I also love that little eight-line container, that sort of rhythmic and that length that is the, is, turns out to be the standard of the tongue. Uh, so, and for the first and only time in my life, I began to write back to, a, to a, an author, a poet. Homeless dogs. I languished in a car with battered friends, the world the same as before we tried to fix it. Young people won't listen to us, and old ones mock our shaggy hair. In despair, we read Han Chan's poems as we drive. Those scribed on stones make us laugh. Those carved on trees make us cry. We devour these thousand-year-old biscuits like homeless dogs. <laughs> so his name was Han Chan, which means cold mountain, taken from the place where he lived out and ended his days. Uh, and the, but the voice came to me, of course, through Burton Watson's 1970 series of translations called Cold Mountain 100 Poems. It, um, and it had this feeling to me, finding my older brother. In history, this never happens, but in life, all the time. My older brother, who died before he was born, has been found. 
He is a thousand years old, more or less. His name is Cold Mountain, a kitchen helper, a poet called by the place where he lives. Since the day I was born, I missed his voice. Over time, his poems began to help me feel healed of a kind of internal nameless ache, as if I were imbibing some Chinese elixir or taking some aspirin, or both. Han Shan is the cure for warts. My job was eating me night and day, my wife threatening to leave, taking even the stroller and the quilt. A family of warts blossomed on my thumb so big I introduced them to tellers and clerks. Ha ha, they'd say, making quick change. Then I bumped into Han Shan in the bookstore, 100 poems so small, I read them all. We moved to a new place. My wife smiles out on sidewalks where children ride. I work in a room so quiet, I can hear my heartbeat. My warts are gone, no marks, no scars. Well, that new place was Minneapolis. We moved from, from Massachusetts to Minneapolis. We anchored our peripatetic VW van and uh, permanently parked in the Lowry Hill neighborhood in 1974. And over the decades, as you all may know, my life, like yours, has ebbed and flowed. But all along the way, I wondered, uh, as I corresponded with this fellow, and I wondered, how did I meet him? Often, I've wondered. Often I've wondered who introduced me to Han Shan. Was it that tousled haired boy in the back of my first class, thick eyeglasses inches from poetry's page? Or that bookstore owner in Massachusetts who filled the prescription I needed? Here, he said, read these. Or the musician poet escaping his mill town in the woods, a laughing monk painted in red on his guitar. Now I hand out his poems like aspirin. Take two, I say. They're small. <laughs> and then, 10 or 15 years ago, one of those mysterious things began to happen. Uh, a sense of gratitude began to bubble up inside me. It's all I can say, how to describe it. And, I had, and this strange dream began to recur. Not a real dream, but a waking dream. That I should, I should say thank you to this man who lived in a cave in the Tiantai Mountains 1,200 years ago, if he lived at all and wasn't a myth. And I had this idea that I should go wandering around madly in China wearing, wearing rope sandals and a, and a, and a, and a you know, a, 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 a hemp robe and lost in the wilderness speaking no Chinese with my finger in the air pointing or holding up my book. Plumes of paper mill steam. On a piece of lined paper the size of a Chinese poem, I write a Chinese-sized poem. The words sound like English because I stand where I was born on the shores of a great lake, her forests and rivers unrolling around me in plumes of paper mill steam. I hope to get to China before I die, where paper was invented and poetry before that. There, my verses will turn into paper. In, I'm sorry, there, my verses will turn into faces, and people will nod it, with gentility and respect. <laughs> so this fantastic scheme is moving me along to thank him. But to complicate matters, I realized I don't speak a word of Chinese. I don't read a word of Chinese. It's really his translator to whom I owe this debt. The great Burton Watson, there have been five great translators. He, he, is the, he is considered the greatest translator of the last 50 years after Arthur Whaley, early before him, of Chinese and Japanese poetry and Buddhist texts. Problem, he's lived in Tokyo for 40 years. Uh, but, so I added him to my fanciful and fantastic itinerary. In fall of 2005, my busy life slowed. The four kids, what were we thinking, out of the house. Finally, it can happen, and it did. And, and I was able to accept a residency at the Anderson Center, a fabulous place if you don't know it, down at Red Wing. All of you should go there to all their events. It's wonderful. 
It's an interdisciplinary artist community, and they gave me a month of sitting still like a monk, something I'd never been able to do in my life since we had children. We were married and had children, or children were married. We don't quite remember what the order was. And Scott taught me to set lead type. And we, and we set the first of these poems uh, in, in, in lead. There's a poem called Setting Lead Type. Every piece is heavy, every movement slow. Care of this kind one is not accustomed to. This letter, is it worth the trouble? That sound, is it really a bird fluttering or a door closing? When every sacred choice is made, the lines are bound with simple string, tied with a common knot. Every step that comes after, the paper, the ink, the bookstore browser, reveals only the lightness. And among the poems I wanted to set was this one, um, Daughters. And thought about this one a long time. A daughter is not a passing cloud, but permanent, holding earth and sky together with her shadow. She sleeps upstairs like mystery in a story, blowing leaves down the stairs, then cold air, then warm. We who at 60 should know everything, know nothing. We become dull and disoriented by uncertain weather. We kneel palms together before this blossoming altar. And a love poem. This one doesn't fit at all, but that Chinese style Lusher poem, this uh, eight line container, it's kind of a one long line, but I had to put it in because it was a good one. Mating for life. So little honestly said back then that did not include skin. Too young to know what baby meant, old enough to glow at the sound. We lay rib over rib, necks straining like swans, and took flight together, wing upon wing, toward a distant coastline, totally familiar, that neither of us could imagine nor describe but where we both knew we would safely arrive. And because this is America, there has to be a poem about sex. But because I'm thinking about Chinese poetry, there has to be this poem, because the Chinese don't write poems about sex and very few about romance. The two things they write most about, friendship and, and immortality. Thinking of sex like the Chinese. Yum, yum. <laughs> and now tea, also carefully laid. <laughs> and a bed of rice from which you arrive to my mouth, moist white grains clinging to smooth sticks. And silk curtains admitting a breeze from your parting. Outside, my friends and I cut and rake the hay, arms moving back and forth like cricket songs. After, we gaze at the horizon of old mountains and wonder how soon we will gather by the clear stream. And another American poem, uh, since this is very close to April 15th. <laughs> it's called Paying Taxes. It should be called The Poet Paying Taxes. I emptied the wastebasket and prepared to add columns. Sold a stack of essays, one thin chapbook. Wrote a poem, recited at weddings. Another wheezed on either side of the deathbed. I count parking receipts, over a hundred. That many days sitting still, window at my back. Surely I must have helped other poets. Just yesterday, 
I gave a homeless man a 10. <laughs> and this one about losing my mind. It's, it's called losing my calendar. It's gone, that black brain in my pocket. Now I know what I should have known before. I'm completely lost. I hang like a chrysalis under a leaf, nothing to do but wait and see how I emerge, insides rearranged. When my morning ends for what I might have been, I will be someone else. My wings will shine. Nothing will know how to stop me except flowers. These aren't Robert's poems. These aren't complicated. <laughs> but I, all right, we'll do it again for Ruth. And thank you for asking. But uh, and I'm bored to go. Lose it well, I know it anyway. Losing my calendar. It's gone, that black brain in my pocket. Now I know what I should have known before. I'm completely lost. I hang like a chrysalis under a leaf. Nothing to do but wait and see how I re emerge insides rearranged. When my morning ends for what I might have been, I will be someone else. My wings will shine. Nothing will know how to stop me except flowers. And this, because this is a poetry reading, and uh, blissfully, uh, and well, uh, and all poetry readings are interesting to me in their, in their way, but uh, this is based upon one that I had in Red Wing, but we've all had many of these in the poetry game. And I've changed the opening of this poem, uh, which had a football an analogy, or a football image, uh, to a baseball image in honor of yesterday. <laughs> Uh, so the title of the poem is Beach Yard Work, she said. <laughs> a baseball sellout requires 38,145. A poetry reading, 11. On a warm Sunday afternoon in May, expect only the shop owner. Tulips march their colorful helmets down the margins of city porches. Trillium cluster the forest floor like gossiping princesses. Bursts of lilac, the fragrance of passion, soften even the rigors of the gas plant. Anyone inside on such a day is clearly kin to the Buddha, or lazy, drunk, or totally lost. So I brought to the Anderson Center my growing collection of, of Chinese poetry books uh, to, to in 2005. And, and lo and behold, all I knew of Cold Mountain was that he, is, that he is quite possibly apocryphal and that the location, which would mean the location, was a myth as well. And one of those was translated by a guy named Bill Porter, otherwise known as Red Pine. They collected songs of Cold Mountain. And, uh, and uh, at the Anderson Center, I opened the book. And early in it, I found uh, a map. But where is that? Uh, I found this, a photograph of the cave in the Tiantai Mountains where he had been. I will spare you the details, but at luck and persistence, he answered his phone. And I said, will you take me to Cold Mountain's cave? And he said, funny, you should mention it. I just started taking people to China. I've traveled all over for 30 years myself alone, and now I'm starting to take people to China. So in 2000, so we began to plan our trip. It was impossible, but maybe becoming possible. Uh, in January 2006, I did my first public reading of the handmade book that we did. Which in the, yeah, I have a copy here. That Red Dragonfly Press did. This is the. This is that book, beautiful book, that, and in this Chinese or Japanese stab binding. And the first reading was done at Birch Bark Books. Robert was in the audience, actually, and did me a great favor, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, so this is where 
this my, was really my first public airing. I'd put together a little chapbook of these poems 10 years before, but this is my first real airing of my affection for this poet and this insane idea to go to China. When sound leaks from a cedar grove. When sound leaks from a cedar grove, better listen. When moss rattles the window pane, better sit up. The pileated woodpecker I chased all summer, big as a hatchet, rounded the cedar trunk, and he tapped out his elusive forest story right in front of me. I leaned back breathless from my desk, forgetting for a moment the chair is broken. Who would have thought I'd find a place so quiet that what is longed for flies right in? And this, and this poem, I'm going to read you the poem as it exists now. And then I'll tell you that I changed. After I saw Robert's eyes, when I read it last time, I knew there was something wrong with it. And he helped me fix it just by his reaction when he read this poem last time. This is called Glacial Erratic. You know what those are. Those are the stones that come out, pressed into the soil by the glaciers, and they keep emerging. And it's my metaphor for what an artist is. Glacial Erratic. In the fields of Wisconsin, rocks with no other names fill cairns like hills where each was hauled. Pieces of the distant north, carried here by ice, buried by ice, moved one last time by human hands. And still, every spring, surprises push up. One of them is you. The other me, outliers, annoyances, placed in a joyous heap around which all straight work eventually must bend. The first version of that, which I thought was very clever and a winner, I really liked it, said, which all, which all, around which all straight important work eventually gets done. It's terrible. But it, it had the wrong image, and it had the wrong image literally. You know, I was a journalist in my day, and I am a journalist still, and a journalist is all about accuracy in describing the outer world, uh, which is why I never listened to Fox News. Uh, and that's a, that's a factual statement. And uh, second, uh, a poet is all about accuracy on the inner landscape. And so it's not about saying anything you want. It's about getting it utterly accurate. And I was wrong. And I was wrong for two reasons. The reaction said I, I, I was wrong about the role of art because I had, I had the straight important work. And the, po and the poet art was a side thing uh, in that first version. And two things happened. One with his reaction, I said, I'm wrong. And second is I ended up standing on a cairn with David Aston up in Kitson County and looking around and seeing the reality. When, when the farmers build those cairns in the middle of the fields, what, are the, what, are the, what do they then do? They plow around it. It changes the contours of everything. A much greater understanding of what art really does. But it took me a while to get there. So I needed then uh, two more people to make this trip work work, and they signed up that night. Uh, Margaret Telfer is on this board who can't be here tonight, but uh, she's just phenomenal. She's the librarian maven and this insane traveler, and her, and her husband, uh, Ed, they lived in Japan. They wanted her dying to go to China and this back roads trip, so we put it together. And the third thing that happened, final thing, we needed five people to make the van work. Who's the fifth person going to be? Short story, long story short, uh, Mike Hazard, who was in this, had joined the sort of rump poetry group I have with some people. We meet once a month or so and, and behave badly at a restaurant raving with poems and, and, and you know, contradicting that sign, which is in most coffee shops, you know, please, for the sake of those around you, no poetry. <laughs> and, and we... And Mike is a great poetic soul, but you will see here in the film that he has done. Mike's a videographer who had made wonderful, wonderful uh, poems, uh, wonderful uh, films, documentary films on Fred Manfred, on Robert Bly, on Thomas McGrath, on Jim Northrup, and on our own, so far as I know, the only truly great poet senator in American history, Eugene McCarthy, very serious poet. Uh, 
And I had contemplated bringing a tape recorder or some way to document this, and finally I said, to hell with it, I know nothing about any of that. I'm bringing a journal and a pen. That's all I care about. And so Mike brought a camera, and the, what you're going to see here is that story. So we went all over what Mike quickly dubbed the Kaching Dynasty. Remember that. It's so uh, since, since the last 30 years, China is the Kaching Dynasty. And uh, I'll end with a couple of poems here by, uh, by uh, one by Cold Mountain, thanks to Burton Watson. Because it turns out this poem is my story, too, and maybe yours. It's the first poem in the book, and it took me 30 years to see this. My mother and father left me a good living. I need not envy the fields of other men. Clack. Clack goes my wife at her loom. Jabber, jabber goes my son at play. Chin in hand, I, I listen to the singing birds. Clapping hands, I urge on the swirling petals. Who comes to commend me on my way of life? Well, a woodcutter sometimes passes by. Oracle bones. You know about the oracle bones. These are these things being increasingly found in great droves in China. People didn't even know they existed. These are the origins of, of Chinese writing. They began in necromancy. They would take these bones, uh, plastrons of, of, of turtles or bones or, or the shoulder bones of oxen, and they would hit them, and they put them in a fire and hit them, and they would crack in a certain way, and the diviners would say, tell the emperor what was going to happen. And this is those little cracks of the origin of Chinese writing and, and that whole writing system. And it go, in my view, they're a lovely metaphor for the duration of, of poetry. Oracle bones. There can be no end to their meaning. Stories spin from them, from them over a thousand years like butterflies over a summer field. Another thousand, like snow-capped mountains you have heard of but never seen. And five thousand years before that, like ghosts you have seen. Teachers, friends, family, all loved. Breathing easy under the drowsy eyelid of earth. So we went to the cave. Uh, and you will see that here. And uh, we meet. In that cave, astonishingly, uh, the current hermit of Cold Mountain, who arrived about five years before we were there, Bill said, and uh, nobody knows where she came from, and nobody knows her name. Bill calls her Butterfly Woman because of her delightful smile, which you will see. I call her, of course, Cold Mountain. So. That's the end of my piece. I'll do one poem at the end. And uh, if someone knows how to turn on the electronics, we'll do that. And if they fail, that's OK, too. Uh, but thank you very much. And uh, we'll, I'll be back after. And thanks to KTCA for showing this in January. Bees, grasshoppers leading the way, butterflies. It's like a chanting in a, in a shrine hall.
little calf. You know the way to Coal Mountain? I came once to sit on Cold Mountain and lingered here for 30 years. Nobody knows his real name. Cold Mountain was his real name. He just showed up one day and started writing poems. Morning sun pops through the jaws of blue peaks. White clouds are washed in the green pond. Who would have thought I would ever leave the dusty world and come bounding up the southern slope of Cold Mountain? The path to Hanshan's place is laughable. A path, but no sign of cart or horse. Converging gorges, hard to trace their twists. Jumbled cliffs, unbelievably rugged. A thousand grasses bend with the dew. A hill of pines hums in the wind. And now I've lost the shortcut home. Body asking shadow, how do you keep up? Here we are in China, as you can hear. Land of a billion and a half people. Finding stillness in China is really rare. But monasteries are a good place to begin, you'd think. Han Chan lived here about 1,200 years ago. They say he was a poor man, a crazy character. Here we sit, a bunch of poor scholars, ravaged by extremes of hunger and cold, out of work, our only joy is poetry. Scribble, scribble, we wear out our brains. Who will read the works of such men? On that point, you can save your size. We could inscribe our poems on biscuits, and homeless dogs wouldn't deign to the Buddhists say he was a Buddhist. The Taoists say he was a Taoist. Um, but nobody claimed him while he was alive. He was always poking fun at people, trying to get them to be, be better. Somebody collected his poems after he disappeared. He left about 300 that they were able to collect. And of course, the, the great deal of controversy is whether they all date from the same time or uh, same person. Well, Lu Qiuyin, a provincial governor, left a text behind uh, that uh, may be real, may be legendary, may be invented, but it purports to tell of a visit 
to a person known as Han Shan. He lived alone 70 li west of the Tangxing district of Tiantai at a place called Cold Mountain. He often went down to the Guoqing Temple. One of the great monasteries of the Tang Dynasty, and this is where he most likely spent his winters. He was good friends with uh, an older monk named Feng Gan, or Big Stick, and a pickup, sure duh, who worked in the kitchen and saved leftovers for old Cold Mountain, who may have lived here in the monastery or lived just outside its walls, nobody knows. Han Shan would come, walking the long veranda, calling and shouting happily, talking and laughing to himself. People in the West like Cold Mountain because she was one of the first uh, poets to use colloquial language. My mother and father left me a good living. I need not envy the fields of other men. Clack, clack goes my wife in her room. Jabber, jabber goes my son at play. Chin in hand, I listen to the singing birds. Clapping hands, I urge on the swirling petals. Who comes to commend me on my way of life? Well, a woodcutter sometimes passes by. Westerners of the uh, 60s and 70s hippies, the Back to Earth movement, venerated that sort of figure. And of course, he was discovered by some people who were, who were key elements in that movement, you know, Gary Snyder, Jack Kerouac. The name that my uh, Zen master gave me uh, are two characters from a Hanshan poem, one that I had translated. <laughs> and it means uh, literally, listen to the wind. The smell and the feel of the uh, uh, High Sierra backcountry was very much in my mind when I did the translation. It was my last quarter uh, in the East Asian Languages Department at Berkeley. I asked my chief professor, Dr. Chen, are there any Buddhist poets I can work on? And he said, oh, I know just the person for you. Cold Mountain, Anshan. I moved to uh, an abandoned cabin in Marin County for the spring and shared it with the uh, uh, novelist Jack Kerouac. And of course, you know, Jack being Jack, he loved the idea of Anshan. Uh, and so did many other feckless youth of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand these bird songs. Now I'll go rest in my straw shack. The cherry flowers out, scarlet. The willow shoots up, feathery. Morning sun drives over the blue peaks. Uh, I put myself into it deeply while meditating oh, that smells like sage, huh? to make it happen in my mind to smell it and feel it, and to sit with it to the point where I felt I had gotten to where the poet had gone, and uh, then try to write it in my own language. I only translated 24 of them. A, a far more thorough set of uh, translations uh, are those of Dr. Burton Watson, uh, who did his, as far as I know, after I did mine, and then I read them with great pleasure. I was living in Japan. Uh, the Japanese were beginning to take an interest again in Chinese literature. And I was doing translation and editing work. So I went to a Kyoto bookstore and I bought an old Japanese oh. copy, woodblock printing. Uh -huh. uh, 1756 is the date. Wow. Hanshan became far more famous in Japan than he was in China. The Never Japanese said. Buddhists took up Hanshan yeah. in a way that the, the Chinese hadn't. And made into uh, a serious Zen figure. Have I a body or have I none? Am I who I am or am I not? Pondering these questions, I sit leaning against the cliff 
while the years go by, till the green grass grows between my feet and the red dust settles on my head. And the men of the world, thinking me dead, come with offerings of wine and fruit to lay by my corpse. Watch your step. Almost there. When I was living at a monastery in Taiwan, there were more pilgrims behind us. The abbot published an edition of Cold Mountain's poems in Chinese, did the whole poems. <sighs> uh, this is Cold Mountain Cave. It's the butterfly woman. Uh, she's still here. So. Right in the monastery I moved into, there was Cold Mountain waiting for me. And uh, so I started working on his poems. You hear the bats? There's probably been people living here just like Cold Mountain did. You know, that's the tradi hermit tradition. He looked like a tramp. His body and face were old and beat, yet in every word he breathed was a meaning in line with the subtle principles of things, if only you thought of it deeply. This must be a statue of Coal Mountain. No matter how disreputable you are, when you die, you always get kicked upstairs. <laughs> they've even, uh, on the backside of the incense burner, they've called this Cold Cliff Temple. So in the local villagers' minds, this is a Buddhist temple. His hat was made of birch bark. His clothes were ragged and worn out. His shoes were wood. Thus, men who have made it hide their tracks. And so these are the statues of Cold Mountain, Pickup, and Big Stick. Big Stick was a monk. Uh, Pickup lived in a monastery in the kitchen, so both would have probably had their heads shaved, whereas Cold Mountain lived outside the pale and only visited. So. Using that, this should be Cold Mountain here. Sometimes intractable, sometimes agreeable, his nature was happy of itself. But how could a person without wisdom recognize him? <laughs> That's almost a, a generic description of a Chinese hermit. Yes. Usually they're so refined. If Cold Mountain were here today, he would laugh himself to death. <laughs> Why? Because Cold Mountain loved to laugh. And no matter how they depicted him, he would have found a way, uh, reason to laugh. <coughs> 停寂何所有出生三十年,長有千萬里,新疆青草河,如塞紅殘氣. Born 30 years ago, I've traveled countless miles along rivers where the green rushes swayed, to the frontier where the red dust swirled. Lin Yao Kung Chiu Xian. I've made elixirs and tried to become immortal. Du Shu Jen Yong Shi, 
I've read the classics and written odes. Jinir Gui Han Shan, and now I've retired to Cold Mountain, Chun Liu Jin Si Er, to lie in a stream and wash out my ears. Great line. It's a great line. It's been quoted a lot later. That sleep by the creek and purify my ears. Uh, in his own poems, there's, this, there's clear evidence he had a family, tried to make it in the capital, regrets not being in the capital sometimes, you know, where, where the action is, working on politics, working as a bureaucrat. The term boiling red dust is, uh, red dust is a common trope uh, for the dusty, dirty turmoil and chaos and moral uh, uh, corruption of cities. So many of the great Chinese poets, they all had a tension, and Han Shan has this as well, between being in the world and being away from the world. So today I'm back at Cold Mountain would be like, I've given up trying to be a Taoist alchemist. I've gone back to my Buddhist practice, which accepts impermanence and uh, looks at uh, the shortness of life in a different way. That's back at Cold Mountain. The birds and their chatter overwhelm me with feeling. At times like this, I lie down in my thatched hut. It's the busy Sunday people world. Recede at Guoxing Temple. Cicadas come up to greet us. Cherries shine with crimson fire. Willows trail their slender boughs. Whoever thought I would leave the dusty world and come bounding up the southern slope of coal mountains. You know the Chinese character for cicada is a character Zen with a bug next to it. These are Zen bugs. There's a naked bug at Cold Mountain with a white body and a black head. His hand holds two book scrolls, one the way and one its powers, the Tao Te Ching. His shack's got no pots or oven. He goes for a walk with his shirt and pants askew, but he always carries the sword of wisdom. He means to cut down senseless craving. Huang 
荒城动客情，高低就质跌。大小古坟茔，自证孤鹏影。长宁拱木生。所接皆属古，先时更无名。We're in Coal Mountain Cave. We're having lunch. It's being prepared for us by a laywoman. Who I fondly call the butterfly woman, who lives here, has lived here for the last five or more years. I know nothing about her. She doesn't speak, nor does she write. But she smiles a lot. Beautiful. And I'm sure if Cold Mountain, in fact, if you visit any hermit in China, this is sort of the reception you general generally receive. Nothing but everything they have. When you find them. When you find them. Well, here is to uh, Coal Mountain Cave. Cheers. 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 All the pilgrims who have come here. Men ask the way to Cold Mountain. Cold Mountain, there's no through trail. In summer, ice doesn't melt. The rising sun blurs in swirling fog. How did I make it? My heart's not the same as yours. If your heart was like mine, You'd get it and be right here. Number 22, a four-line poem. On top of Cold Mountain, the lone round moon lights the whole clear cloudless sky. The, uh, the full moon is a, the Buddhist symbol for full enlightenment. From the commenta commentaries are by Buddhist monks, Japanese monks, and they say, well, he does, couldn't really be unhappy because he's enlightened. <laughs> Zen doesn't mean being happy all the time, it means being what you are at the time. If you're unhappy, be unhappy. And if you're happy, be happy. But don't cling to it. I realized that Chen, Shershiang, had really put me on to a challenge, that he had given me something to really work on. Uh, you know, much more uh, challenging for me than uh, the ordinary Chinese great poet, even though they're very great, and they're very, very hard to translate sometimes. Uh, this was more personal, you know, because it touched on things I thought I should be trying to do in my own life and in my own practice. Well, one of the things about Han Chan and who he is and how he struck me immediately, he's very funny. Do you have the poems of Han Chan in your house? They're better for you than sutra reading. Write them out and paste them on a screen where you can glance them over from time to time. Once at Cold Mountain, troubles cease. No more tangled, hung up mind. I idly scribble poems on the rock cliff, taking whatever comes like a drifting boat. I came once to sit on Cold Mountain and lingered here for 30 years. Yesterday I went to see relatives and friends. Over half had gone to the Yellow Spring. Bit by bit, life fades like a guttering lamp, passes on like a river that never rests. 
This morning I face my lonely shadow, and before I know it, tears come streaming down. Some of these I read when my father died, so we had a little family ceremony of our own. <laughs> and I read Han Shan. He wasn't writing for the elite educated classes. He wasn't trying to impress people with his erudition by, by making all kinds of literary references and allusions like most Chinese poets did of the Tang Dynasty. He wrote to people's hearts, from his heart. I would say I favor, you know, the Han Shan version of Zen. But some people think you know, Han Shan isn't upbeat or sustainedly upbeat enough. Uh -huh. uh, but that's what makes it interesting as poetry. Well, this has been a great honor for us. Poets are almost never discovered in their own lifetime. It always takes a, a good death or a good disappearance. And people have revered him ever since. One of the differences between China and Japan, uh, between them, say, and the Occident, is they still enjoy the idea of poet eccentrics. And they can recognize them when they see them. And uh, they won't make a fuss about a person like that when they're alive. But after they're dead, they'll admire them <laughs> and publish their books and talk about them. But they'll wait till they die. Han san you luo chung, shen bai er tou hei. Shou ba liang juan shu, yi dao. Two things I need to say. Uh, three, three. One is uh, obviously I thank Mike Hazard and, and his editing partner Deb Walwork for this phenomenal piece here. Uh, second, uh, I didn't get to this part of the story about Gary Snyder, but I've known Gary Snyder since 1969, since I ran a poetry series in Wisconsin. So I was hosting a poetry program in California the following spring, and we were able to, uh, Mike and I, to convince Gary to be part of this, and it really added so much. And I'm going to tell you here, and you're the first people to know this, Gary has agreed to come here tentatively, but I hope, uh, next spring. And so look for that in April, next April, at Plymouth Congregational Church at the Literary Witness Series. Um, and then I have to thank uh, Jim Perlman, who is in the audience tonight, because the this book, which we're talking about tonight, and the next book coming out, uh, one of the things that was a revelation for me is at the last thing that the designer the decision Jim's designers made on this was was a revelation. They turned it sideways, and he said they didn't want to break the lines in the poems, and it made this wonderful horizontal format and a beautiful design. And it's really an honor to be inside this wonderful design. And to add that this, this cover illustration of Cold Mountain, do you have any idea where it came from? It comes from the basement archives of the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Uh, a great find. So I'll do two short poems here to end this, my end of the story. And if you want to do any questions, we can do that, or we can just party down. Uh, This is about that last sound. You know, one of the things, the only thing I don't like about this film is that I look stoned throughout. 
as you as you clearly noticed. And the only answer, and it really just occurred to me sitting here there, is I was. <laughs> I mean, I really was. I mean, this was the kind of bliss that, I mean, this is kind of thing that you never, this is not, none of this is supposed to happen, and it was happening in real time. And I sit there, look, all my eyes are closed, I'm nodding off, I can hardly... <laughs> But this is what that last thing is about, and this will be in the next book, and, and, uh, and then I'll give you this one. This is called Final Sound at Guo Ching Temple. <coughs> Oops, where'd it go now here? Oh, where'd you go? oh, here you go. Final Sound at Guo Ching Temple. After the tide of pilgrims withdraws, cicada song. The long arc of their longing pitched high as the bow of sky. So that is the sound ringing in my ears. Tinnitus, the doctors say. <laughs> I have no choice but to listen night and day. Out of the ground I crawled up the rough bark of an ancient tree. At 63, nearer the crown than the roots, I pause and rub my bones together and wait for your reply. And this little detail. Do you have the poems of Len Festi in your house? They are better for you than scripture reading. <laughs> Take them out and paste them over the television set and glance them over from time to time. <laughs> Thank you. I may have addressed, answered any or all of your questions. You can ask any, or, or we can. Uh... Yes. Uh, very little. As it was pointed out, it's very interesting. The Chinese do not read Han Shan. They are actually suddenly immensely curious about this phenomenon in America. Gary touched on a couple things. Some people got to him through this. Uh, Gary's, uh, Jack Kerouac's second best book is Dharma Bums, which features a thinly disguised Gary Snyder and the character of Jaffe Ryder, who is sitting around translating these poems. And, and the, the book is dedicated to Cold Mountain. That's not how I came to him at all. I came through him through this wonderful book, which is my scripture, by the way. And I, famous for losing my calendar, have not lost this for 30 years my worn scripture that I carry with me. And this is, this is Cold Mountain, 100 poems of Tang Dynasty poet Han Shan, translated by Burton Watson. Still in print. I hope you can get yourselves a copy. Used to be they had that lovely little edition, which I would hand out like aspirin. Um, but in China, uh, I think because, as Bill Porter said, Red Pine, the tra uh, current translator, uh, he, he wrote in the colloquial. And he doesn't have, do the, f the great tropes. And Chinese, as you can hear, uh, the, the game of, the, of Chinese poetry has to do with a kind of layering, like the tones that are layered as well. And he doesn't play those games. He speaks in really ordinary speech. And that's not beautiful, apparently, in Chinese. And beauty is a great, for example, Wang Wei, uh, uh, considered absolutely beautiful. I have re hardly ever read a translation of Wang Wei that works for me in English. In Chinese, he's just plain beautiful, uh, right? I mean, I see you nodding back there, but that's what I understand. I mean, then there's other great, great poets. I love many of them, and Li, uh, Li Bai and, and Du Fu and from that era, and Jia Dao, there are many others. And the, in the book, I'll tell you, the next book, I'll tell you all the stories about them that I know. And, but. That's the reason we guessed. And there's a book now coming out, maybe like any day now, from a scholar in Hong Kong, who I was slightly interviewed in it. Gary, of course, is all through it. Uh, on this, and it's a book of this question, what's with the Americans? What's with this fascination with Cold Mountain? So we'll see what the scholar uh, says. Yes. The graphics, which are quite wonderful, although I hated them at first, but that was my, my problem. I, I, a wonderful artist named John Aker, and, uh, and uh, it was a wonderful way to put those poems together. Uh, but for me, when I first saw them, they were shocking. I recommend, by the way, if you like this, but you want to, uh, Mike Hazard's, the, 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 the video is available through his website, the CIE, and you can get this and watch it again and again. I've seen it plenty of times. 
and uh, I found it, you know, it gets better and better every time because some of these little sharp tropes go by pretty fast. Uh, but it's a wonderful, wonderful video. So uh, uh, Mike hired him. He did it for very little money. The whole thing was on the cheap, but we pulled it off. Well, thank you so much for being here, for being part of this. And Marcia, let's just say uh, this is – uh, this institution is a great gift, and this series is a great gift to poetry. And I'm uh, thrilled to have been here first. And I hope that I uh, that the pancakes and bacon and the maple syrup will roll on year after year. And bless your heart. Well, as Jim said, we should party on. Was that the right word? Or party down, sorry. Um, reception is outside. Uh, Jim will be there to sign books, and we have Holy Cow Press uh, selling books as well. So thank you all for coming, and we'll hope to see you out there. <laughs>